This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, what I've learned working at Apple's is that it just it draws a certain level of fanaticism. And um, that can be a good thing and that can be a bad thing. And I'm probably an Apple fanatic as well. Um, this is, and I'll try to not, I, I want you to pay attention to this slide. This is a postcard from Sweden. And it makes a nice artwork, but I'll show you later what I mean by uh, being a fanatic. This was also an opportunity where an artist came to see our Apple collection. She had seen the Botany of Desire. She fell in love with her apple trees, and she brought three artists from uh, LA to take pictures of our apples in the winter. It's a muslin sheath. It's about 20 by 30. And you put it up in the middle of the orchard in winter, and it acts like a giant sail. And only the PhD was behind the sail trying to keep it in line. And then I went, wait a minute, these guys are too smart to try to keep that from blowing away. This, they use nails to stick all the apples in. I thought when they made that, that postcard, so you can see the extent, that's probably you know, 30 by 40 feet. They place each apple in between the nails rather than just stick it on a nail so that they can use the apples after. Now that's crazy. OK, so another apple fanatic that re resulted in a lot of the apples that you know today was Johnny Appleseed. Johnny Appleseed was a real person, uh, went by the name of John Chapman. He thought it was morally um, bad to graft apple trees, and I'll talk about grafting a little bit later, that you should only spread seed. But he was a really savvy businessman, and he collected seed from cideries, and he went all over the eastern U.S. and gave out seed in exchange for people listening to him about his religion. He died a very wealthy man, um, but Disney um, loved the story, and so there's more books on Johnny Appleseed that you can even shake a stick at. But he was responsible by spreading these seeds. Because apples were not native to the US, we only had small crab apples, and a lot of the colonist apples weren't adapted. By spreading these seeds, they intermated and were selected for hardy material, and that became the evolution of apples like Rome Beauty and others. OK, so uh, Nigel talked about the challenges. One of the challenges is we can't even agree on a scientific name. The US goes by Malus domestica. Europe largely goes by Malus pumila. And uh, people from Germany argue that it should be sylvestris. And so apple is an ancient alley polyploid that behaves like a diploid. But there's also triploids, tetraploids, apomix. We have gametophytic incompatibility, and what that ensures is that apple is outcrossing. So you can't plant one apple tree. You have to plant two to allow for pollen uh, spread. And when I took plant breeding courses, I always heard about um, inbreeding, a trait of interest. Well, in apple, there's inbreeding depression. So you can't breed back and retain the cultivar. So every cross I make are new hybrids. And it's clonally propagated. So the origin of apple is in the Kazakhstan, uh, China region. And it's been of scientific interest to get germplasm uh, from the center of origin that might have genes of interest. Um, and there's been a lot of exploration by Cornell scientists to go to these areas and collect apples. And their exploits were covered by Cornell because I guess the, the native monkey populations figured if um, they collected the apples, the monkeys wanted to steal the bags of apples, and so they had to beat off the, the hordes of monkeys. The other reason that the Kazakh forests became of interest is, how many people here have read Michael Pollan's Botany of Desire? OK, if one more person calls us and says, I want to walk through the Kazakh forests, and it was wonderful because it got people interested. He talked about the genetic diversity in this, uh, these seedling populations of Kazakh uh, apples. But I think the people that read it seemed to think that we had nothing else to do but take people through these forests. And the diversity is tremendous, but I hope to show you today that the diversity in our populations 
is equally impressive because Apple is very heterozygous and has a lot of genes that um, lend itself to diversity. So most of you um, have seen different apples, but the germplasm collection at the USDA houses two to 3,000 different apple accessions, including those from the origin um, of the species. The curator is Dr. Uh, Zhang, uh, Ganwan Zhang, and the curator is Thomas Chow. And they are very active in, in expanding the collection, but also doing very valid phenotyping and genotyping. They're looking at SNP markers, and they're also looking at genome-wide association studies. And what's great about that collection is I get to use it and don't have to pay for its maintenance. Now, Nigel made me feel old because I usually tell people, don't tell when I graduated from college. <laughs> <laughs> That's past history. But I did go back to an Apple gene list that when I came and took over the job, this was the status in 1963 of the Apple genes that we knew about, all of 10. And even there, they weren't really all documented. And what I hope to show you today is that we've made remarkable progress, but the sad part is about five of these still remain not quite investigated. The first linkage map was developed at Cornell by a hybrid of the crabapple white angel by Rome Beauty. And um, again, I'll show my age. The uh, apple map was largely isozymes and rapid markers. And the coverage was pretty slim, but we were thrilled. And next, in 2010, we have the apple genome published. And obviously, it comes from the efforts of a lot of people, but this really broke through things for us. So we were able to have the genome sequence of Golden Delicious, and that is now available for us to look at in terms of looking at markers or genes of interest. I'm also a member of the Rosebreed, uh, one of those large multi-state um, projects, and I was talking to someone and I said, the, there's three apple breeders in the US. And somebody said, well, gee, for security of our national food supply, should you all be in the room at the same time? And if you go to Japan or China or other places, there's tons of apple breeders. But here, there used to be probably an apple breeder in every state. Uh, Kate is at Washington. I'm at Cornell. And Jim Luby is in Minnesota. We also have a big Rosebury Advisory Committee. What we want to do is use the collections that all of us have, as well as the breeding populations, to um, come together and share data on phenotyping and genotyping. We found out very quickly that a lot of our parents were not what they should be. Uh, Honeycrisp was a surprise because not only was the pollen parent what it wasn't supposed to be, but the seed parent wasn't what it was supposed to be. And it's hard to goof up the seed parent. So we're using this, and we came together, and we realized that we wanted to emphasize quality. And we know that the most important traits for consumers are crispness and crunch, but texture, flavor. However, maintenance of this quality through time is really essential. And markers have been developed and are being tested across populations. OK, I'm going to give you really fast facts on the Apple Breeding Program. But if you're at Cornell and on Ithaca, you should know that we are one of the oldest programs. We're one of the largest uh, in the world. We've named 66 varieties, and we very much integrate genetics, genomics, and breeding. Um, we're multidisciplinary. We benefit very greatly from the expertise um, found um, in Ithaca and Geneva. And Cornell Cooperative Extension plays a vital role in putting out a lot of our materials in grower trials, collecting data, and getting the grower feedback um, on some of this material. OK, so we make controlled hybrids. We do do transgene technology, but a lot of times, um, and especially within two weeks, unlike last year where we got frozen out, we should have apple blossoms. And we go for the apple blossom at this popcorn stage. We don't want bees to visit the flower. So we select one parent as a seed parent, and the other parent we choose to get pollen from. And I got grief. Uh, my husband and I were dating. And I was out in the field doing this process, which is called emasculation. 
And he said, you look tired. And I said, yeah, I've been emasculating all day. And he said, you really shouldn't say that in public. <laughs> so he's gotten used to it. He still won't volunteer to help. But so we removed the, we removed the petals and the anthers, again, so bees won't visit. And it guarantees that when you buy an apple in the grocery store, the seeds could be hybrids with crab apples or any other variety. When I make a cross, I'm controlling both the mother and the father. So every seed within that apple are sisters. I don't know why we don't say brothers, but they're all sisters. And I can plant thousands of these apples and they maintain the genetic characteristics of the mother combined with the father. And our goal is to produce better varieties than what we currently have. But then the beauty of it is once I find something that I like, so the seeds are planted, they're on seedling roots, and it used to be it took forever, eight to 12 years from planting a seed to getting fruit. We can get fruit in the fourth leaf, so four years after planting. And in fact, one of the selections that we named was 12 years from making the cross to um, commercialization. Now, those of you that work with tomato and Arabidopsis are saying 12 years, but it used to be 40. So we're, we feel like we're rocket science. So you see a selection that you like, and then you take a bud stick. And as many buds are on that stick, I can make exact clones of that selection. And so every Fuji apple derives back from the original Fuji clone in Japan, Macintosh, etc. So I take a bud. I put it on a rootstock that's been bred by Gennaro Fazio to dwarf the tree, bring it into production sooner. We allow that bud to take, and then the top of the rootstock is cut off, the bud becomes the tree. And so anytime you see a tree in somebody's yard or in an orchard, you see the swelling, and that's the joint union of the scion, the fruiting part, and the rootstock. And what I always love about science is I love what I do and I get to work on stuff that I get to eat all the time. Gennaro Fazio loves what he does and he works with roots. I don't quite get that. Okay, Cornell varieties. We're very well known for Cortland. Cortland was released in 1915. It's going to be an antique in two years. So it's going to have a hundred year anniversary. It's still a popular variety. McCowan in 1923. So if you come from Cornell or BTI, you don't call it McCoon, it's McCowan, named for a breeder in Canada, and Empire 1968, and John of Gold 1966. How many of you have had John of Gold? Hey, good, good crowd. So really good apple uh, rated by a lot as a top uh, dessert variety, but it became more popular in Belgium than it did here. Okay, so we had a good track record, but what we were pleased about is we were asked to give out apples at uh, Capitol Hill, and I was competing giving out apples against free champagne, wine, hors d'oeuvres, oysters, and we were like, this is going to be a long night. And some of the staffers whose favorite apple in New York was Granny Smith, which does not ripen within our climate, tried some of our apples and started yelling, get out of here. And so we knew we had some apples that were going to be popular if we could get enough growers to try them. But our industry is a little complicated. We have 674 apple growers. We're second in the nation in production, a distant second from Washington, but we've had a program well before they did. Uh, Macintosh is still our number one variety. And what was interesting is, uh, have you, some of you heard about Sweet Tango? It's a club variety. So the breeder in Minnesota made this variety. One person in Minnesota got rights to it, and everybody else was shut out. Some people in New York State were able to grow it, and brothers on two farms next door, one would have it and one wouldn't. And what we didn't want to do is come up with an exclusive variety and shut out our growers. And I needed money for the program, so we thought, can we do a plan where New York growers will have exclusive rights to two of these new varieties and give the industry an advantage and give us some needed income? So we decided that because there were 674 growers, we had to have an organization that did not exist before. To move them forward, we needed the growers to buy in and plant sufficient volume to gain a market. 
Empire, when it first came out, somebody might grow five trees, 10 trees, an acre of trees, and then the grocery store would say there's not enough volume. And so you're between a rock and a hard place. If you don't have enough volume, you can't sell it to the grocery stores. The grocery stores don't say, okay, if you get enough volume, we'll buy it. So we knew we needed to get the industry to, to commit to planting enough to give 400,000 boxes so that there was enough volume for marketing. But we also needed dollars for marketing and promotion because that sells a variety. So um, a year or two ago, we formed uh, the New York Apple Growers, came up with the New York Apple Growers Limited Liability Corporation, and we're equal partners in the commercialization of these two varieties. We share equally in risks and rewards. Royalties are split between the corporation and myself, not myself, <laughs> my program. And also, we um, started something where normally we get a royalty per tree. Now, with these varieties, we get a royalty per tree and a royalty per box of fruit sold. And as an apple breeder, to be able to say that we've gotten a commitment to plant 900 acres of these two varieties is pretty amazing, and it's going to be within over the next two years. And about 60% will be something uh, for New York 1, and 40% will be New York 2. That are not, those will not be their names. Um, the names will be announced soon. Um, we just needed to hold it with patenting. There's marketing plans underway. It'll be in stores in 2014, but I think it will be at Cornell Orchards this fall. And the reaction has been very good. So New York 1, um, Honeycrisp fans here? Okay, if you like Honeycrisp, you're gonna like New York 1. It has Honeycrisp as one parent, but is more attractive. Um, I'll let Chris Watkins argue the production challenges that we might have, but I would beg to say that we have a lot less problems than the Honeycrisp parent. Um, it's got high sugar and has done well. New York 2 appeals to, to people that like a little bit more sugar acid balance. It also is very low browning. And it, it's nice that these two varieties are different and it appeal to different consumers. But the beauty of having something like this is not only was the industry behind it, but Chris Watkins, Jackie, and, and Franny um, arranged opportunities for growers to try these apples under different storage regimes and not know what those storage regimes were and comment on the quality. And these are all commercial growers. And the beauty of it is these guys all have their own businesses. So Niagara is on top of what they do to make a living every day. And so here's an example of the post-harvest assessment where uh, we're ranking um, what the quality was at different times, hoping to draw what the best uh, storage temperature would be and also the, the atmosphere at which it's stored. And then we also got um, Deb uh, Perosio in the Dyson School to have students come up with names for these apples. Some of them were great, some of them were awful, um, but the students really got into it and it was uh, a nice opportunity. I'm gonna switch a little bit because I recognize that not very many of you are going to go into apples as a career, uh, not when you can work on a Arabidopsis, but I'll hope to, to bring in some ideas and maybe have you think of apples in a little bit different way. So what if you come out of this and you end up in a new position and you're working on a new crop or a crop that you really are not familiar with? What do you know about that plant that you will be investigating? And I'm not trying to be preachy, but we all learn that even when you've been in a position a long time, it's surprising how much you can learn that isn't known or may not be in the literature. So understanding variation is huge. So if you find yourself researching anything new, understanding the range of materials that is available is crucial because a lot of studies are done on common cultivars, but there is such a range for whatever characteristic that you're looking at. But more importantly is how to phenotype properly at the right stage. If you're doing gene expression studies or any study, 
getting the plants at the right stage and minimizing the variation that's inherent in every crop, but especially apples, um, is important. And in all grants, there's a lot of money for genotyping, but we're recognizing that there's a phenotyping bottleneck. And so your, your markers and your genetic discoveries are only as good on the material and the phenotyping that it's based in. It's like computers, garbage in, garbage out. And unfortunately, this view is still very much minimized or ignored. So I give an example, an apple that a lot of researchers had not been aware of, some of the visiting scientists. There's five, um, can I say five? There's six. <laughs> Usually five. Uh, flowers per cluster, and this is the dominant, the king dominant apple. So that what, what that means is it's kind of a evolutionary perspective. The first apple is wonderful quality, but if you get frozen out, then those laterals will still give you a crop. So it allows apple to set under adverse conditions. However, if you're doing physiology studies or um, gene expression studies, if you're choosing the king flower that's the best fruit sometimes, and then you're choosing the laterals, you're comparing a little bit apples and oranges. So you're not standardizing it. So you either choose all laterals or thin it down to a certain number or choose only kings. And then some varieties are very much king dominant and others aren't. And when you remove the fruits to study, you're stimulating ethylene production. So if you're studying ethylene response, removing those fruits can be problematic. And you know it sounds kind of common sense, but sometimes researchers have used fruit from a grocery store without an understanding of the physiology of what's going on. The other aspect that you may not know if you say, get me some apples or some kumquats to study, is the crop load. You want a balance between vegetative and, and uh, reproductive fruit and leaves. And if that balance isn't there, it's going to greatly affect the quality of your fruit. So this is a case where the fruit is very much overset. You're going to have reduced level of quality in those fruits. You're going to have differences in ripening. Um, so it's understanding that balance. Environmental effects. Can you tell me what differs between those two fruits? Light. Okay, so you're right. It's the same variety. One is getting a lot of sunlight, the other isn't. One is probably more mature. But knowing that is really crucial. It can make a difference between the sun and the non-sun side of the fruit in terms of chemical composition. And you want to have good light exposure. When you're dealing with seedling populations, which I do, that can be a challenge. Complexity. What's the sample size that's needed? If you have that kind of variation, you'll see sometimes sample size of four. Well, how is that determined? I had four fruits. <laughs> and you know, usually there's good reasons and there's a lot of great papers in terms of sample size to have a valid, uh, but that needs to really be taken into effect. And then there's the general variability. Are you choosing fruit that represents the extent of the crop on the tree? Are you choosing the best fruits? And all of that's going to influence the results that you get. Develop, developmental stage is very important. And we've reached a long uh, milestone in understanding it better. So Jansen did some um, EST work where he characterized from the flower stage to fruit development what was happening with cell division, cell elongation, starch, uh, and ripening. A recent paper by Schaefer um, also looked at changes depending on when you harvest it. If you harvest it too early, your volatiles are going to be influenced, your ethylene is going to be influenced, skin color changes, acidity, and starch. So understanding the right stage is crucial. Now I'm going to switch a little bit more because many of you have probably not seen an apple tree that looks like this. I came back from a, a a visit to a researcher and I started talking about this tree and they just kind of shook their head. This is an apple that, this isn't a great picture, should have used a different one. It has usually fruits up and down like Brussels sprouts. Um, and it's a, a homeotic mutation, it's a dominant gene, and it gives us a relatively, we thought, simple system to study a complex trait. 
And you can see that I wasn't the only one that became enamored of it because we did the first QTL studies using the columnar gene in 1997, I think, in Apple. And now, just in two, uh, 2013, you can see physical characterization, a really nice study of columnar hor hormones, and fine genetic mapping, this by um, our uh, Geneva group, including Jan Bai, who's in the audience. Um, and so, it, but what's interesting about this, this hormone work, we have a columnar apple and we have the tree, so this was a genetic sport. Uh, a grower discovered that one of the branches had a lot of changed inner nodes. He propagated it, he found that it was true to form, that it produced this uh, reduced lateral branching. And when you use it in breeding, about 50% of the seedlings can be columnar. In this hormone study, he compared the columnar tree by a non-columnar, non-related apple. So you had a chance to look at something that was genetically similar, but the analysis was, was shifted a little bit. OK, so this is where sometimes as a breeder you get to do fun stuff. Columnar apple, dominant gene. Weeping apple, dominant gene. What do you think happens when I cross the two? I didn't know, so we'll make the cross. Yep, and it helps if you switch with the, the button instead of the clicker. We got trees that were columnar on the top, somewhat weeping on the bottom. We also got columnar, but you can see this is what usually happens. You get uh, trees that look like cigarro uh, cactus. You have lateral branches, but they're all very upright. You get weeping and um, our physiologist said you get trees that really don't know what they want to do. Um, but this is interesting. Um, I've seen a lot of apple trees. I've never seen any that look like that. You want apple trees to produce, to have really straight branches. It brings them into production sooner. Um, I think we got a little carried away there. This is an example where you're having good segregation of columnar and standard. When you use weeping, you can get, this is not a pruned tree. It looks like spokes on a wheel. We think it's an oxen mutation. And um, so again, we're seeing variation that you're not going to read about until we get closer to publishing. And it may offer chances to investigate parts of your crop that were not possible. So I told you that we use rootstocks to dwarf trees, but what if you didn't have to use rootstocks? So this is a seedling that is about four years old. Its sisters are 10 feet tall. Um, and we have some of these that fruit very early in the juvenile period. This are two sister seedlings, same age, same cross, one being dwarf, one being standard. And um, my PhD student who finished recently is, and now is post-docking with the Leng Cheng um, used some of this unique material. So this is a four-year-old seedling fruiting, and um, its sisters are probably 20 feet high, to look at GA content with Peter Davies um, in plant biology. The other thing that people don't tell you, and I've been beating about is that sometimes in your studies, if you're doing mapping populations or you're looking at segregation of traits, there may be lethals that either the breeder or whoever's looking at the seedlings may not realize exist. This is pale green lethal. The seedlings come up, they die, they don't have uh, good chlorophyll development, they die, and if you don't see them soon enough, you just think you didn't get germination. But it's uh, a heterozygous, a lot of plants are heterozygous for this trait, and we are finding that it's linked to certain uh, alleles. In this case, these are three different um, plant types in the same population, and these small ones tend to die. A lot of the segregation distortion we see, we think, are due to a lot of these lethal or sublethal plants. This is what columnar looks like in a seedling population. You can see the reduced inner node length as opposed to its standard colleagues. So I had a student that came in and he was very interested in how hybrids coexist. So when you make wide crosses, which we can do in Apple, how can they coexist and 
how do they decide, like the case with Weeping versus Columnar, which ones survive? So we used a columnar um, parent because we argued that the columnar gene should be maintained and we could also follow it phenotypically. We used uh, one of the parents of that hybrid as a control because, again, I can't back cross to the same parent. And we used two different Malus species. Malus fuspa is one of the native crab apples, and Malus dumerii is um, from um, uh, Taiwan area and is very low chilling and not much is known about it. And we wanted to see if we made this cross, would we see columnar, uh, would we not, and would we see certain lethalities or genes being turned on or turned off. And Ben Archeski is the student that's looking at it and he's going to be looking at methylation, activation of transposons and other attributes. A normal seedling was like the picture I showed you, a straight shoot. This has world leaves and has a lot more inner nodes in a, a, a slight uh, area. And it's not columnar, but it's not your standard apple tree. This is an apple tree that had 21 laterals. We don't get laterals in seedling populations, but in these interspecific populations, we're getting laterals and we think we're gonna get really early fruit production. Same population. We're seeing perhaps a columnar manifestation, but dwarfed for some reason. And we're seeing very um, strange uh, multiple laterals. And so this material, Eric Richards is on, um, and Mike Scanlon are on, on Ben's um, dissertation committee. And they came out to the field and they said, Susan, we didn't think we'd say this, but you almost have too much variation, which can be a good thing, but will make it challenging. Okay, red skin color. Red skin color should be easy. Red was supposed to be dominant to yellow. Okay, so we developed a marker for red color in um, apple. And to tell you the truth, I didn't think I would select out yellow apples. You know, there's good quality in both of them. We developed a, a marker at Cornell in 1996, but it didn't work for green. And then there's been a lot more studies on apples, so transgenic studies, overexpressing genes, but the problem is you can have a marker for red versus yellow, but you don't have for color pattern. So striping versus not, extent of the surface colored and the intensity. What was determined in a study is that when you have striped apples, the uncolored sectors are actually methylated. So that's the color pattern difference. So this is the kind of variation we see for apple color. This is one population, one apple from each of different seedling trees. And yes, we could have selected for 50% red. Um, this is the color variation. So we have red, we have purple, we have orange. In this case, we would have selected these two, but this whole cross obviously has some issues. Again, one seedling from each. And then this is a really interesting attribute where we have expression of color in the third layer of the epidermis. So usually you have color expression in the first layer. In this case, there's color in the third layer that's showing through and giving us this broad striping. And I'm gonna condense a lot of it because if anybody is really interested in all the intricacies of Apple, I, I'd be glad to send you a PDF. I just wanted to show you that we really are making a lot of progress. Like other crops, MIB transcription factors are responsible for red color. Um, there's an ancient duplication of this transcription factor and it's responsible for the red color. We have some apples that you cut them in half and they look like beets, they're so red inside. They're being marketed for anthocyanin, but a lot of them are really tannic and astringent. So if you see them at the store, uh, ask for a sample before you buy them. Um, and then we also are seeing phenotypic changes. They're taking some of these genes, they're expressing them in apple or other crops and finding out what phenotypic changes are occurring. And in some cases, it's, it's really major. The beauty is some of those crosses that I made with crab apples give me a byproduct, and that's ornamental types. And so we have some double flowered uh, crabs, and we have segregation. This is a red flowered, red petaled apple. And so um, it's nice that I get to study some of the genetic aspects, but also have a secondary market. 
We are making sure that those crab apples are resistant to scab. Scab is something that we get quite a bit of time in the uh, orchards in New York State because scab likes rainy seasons in the spring. And what do we have? Rainy seasons in the spring. We can screen seedlings at a young stage. If it has this reaction, it's resistant. If it has this reaction, it's susceptible. But the beauty is that if the leaf looks like that, the fruit of that tree is going to have scab four years after when it, when it um, fruits. So there's good correlation. We've done a lot with apple scab, herbaldwinkle. Um, we developed markers. We looked at interactions. We found new sources of resistance. We've looked at transgenic approaches. But unfortunately, 99% of the material that's scab resistant today relies on one gene for resistance. And so we have to change that, and we will be pyramiding genes for resistance. But it's only good if you have scab resistance, if you have resistance to powdery mildew or black rot. With the climate change, we're seeing new diseases and disorders that were not problematic before. This is fire blight, which we now have a antibiotic resistant strain in New York, which is going to cause our growers some issues. OK, so again, I said it's important to know variation, but it's also important to know if there are breeders in the crop that you're working with or people that have spent a lot of time with the plant, they might know of oddities that will help you understand it. And so we keep a lot of stuff which previous breeders would throw away. So you know citrus can flower and fruit? Well, so can apples. Not ideal. I don't think we're going to get two crops out of it, but interesting. These, the parent of these two, these are one fruit from each of seedlings. The entire progeny look like that. Not a home run. I got my PhD in genetics so I could avoid things like that. Sometimes the dice just fall where they are, and we were getting genes for bad fruit finish. Again, the same idea. We can get not such variation, but if all of them are rusted, it's not going to help you any. And this is an apple that every fruit is chimeric. So we see that the fruit color is in sectors like Gala will do, but every single fruit on that tree is chimeric, which could be of interest. Fruit size. Supposedly, there's five genes for fruit size. I can't win the lottery, but I can make a cross and hit all five recessive genes in one cross. Every seedling in this cross is small. But we think that they're, it's scab resistant, and it's certainly odd. They taste good. And so a grower told me that he could make a market with these, selling them as apple nuggets. We'll see. OK, brief glimpse at some Cornell research, and I'm going to make this really brief because I'm running out of time. So I didn't know Chris Watkins was going to be here, and I did say good things about him. So he's a valued colleague and cooperator, as well as his cohort there. Um, Chris is, and Nigel have done some really, oops. Oh, I, I'm talking to the slide and don't have it up there. Sorry. Um, have done some innovative work at looking at softening and also um, storage disorders. So when you see an apple in the store, it's perfect. Um, when I first got involved with post-harvest, I was we put them in storage, we took them out, and it was ugly. And the post-harvest guys are like, wow, this is great, all these diseases and disorders. And I'm crying, because everything's a mess. We're, we're making progress. Le Leng Cheng um, is uh, known for his work in sorbitol. Um, also looking at metabolism, and as I said, this, he's looking at the sun exposed and the shaded part, which is important. And um, we're lucky to have these type of people at Cornell at our access. Kanang Zhu is a tree fruit genomicist stationed um, at Geneva. He's been looking with La Lang about some of the um, malic acid genes and also co collaborating with someone, I believe, at BTI with aluminum and also looking at the CO gene. Ruhai Lu and Sai Li are probably known as the gurus of antioxidants and have done work on the benefits of phytochemicals and also which compounds are most of interest because some compounds could be excreted and not beneficial and so it's helpful to have them on board. We can find sometimes interesting anomalies. This is New York 674. Those are its two parents. And we found out in processing them, the equipment 
broke down that these did not brown or browned a lot less than their counterparts. And so what this is helpful for is studies of apple dippers or fresh cut slices. And so we have quite a project. I had a graduate student, Andrea Burke, that found a lot of our advanced selections are better than um, what's currently out there and could be put into apple dippers and not um, have to be treated with ascorbic acid. Okay, other Cornell researchers include Terence Robinson, who works to convert uh, apple orchards to really high density, and Herb Waldwinkel, who has been key in doing a lot of the transgenic research. So transgenic apples, um, you can be a proponent or not, but we've learned a lot by using them. Um, we have, they add to our understanding about mechanisms of ripening or genes. Um, silenced plants have added to our role of understanding ethylene and reduced sorbitol as uh, Lelang is looking at and PPO silencing like the Arctic series is of interest. Interestingly, the Arctic series which may be deregulated in the U.S. which were not from our program, the U.S. apple industry has decided that they're not sufficiently in advance to the consumers to support the technology. They support the technology but don't feel it's enough of a change to commercialize. We're going to have plenty of new hybrids. Um, Cornell Orchards is going to have a number of them for you to try and if you find something and like it, please let me know. If you don't like it, tell Nigel. <laughs> Um, I really want to thank current and former students, uh, my technician Kevin Maloney, my Cornell colleagues, uh, funding from a lot of different sources. And we're not breeding apple trees without leaves, but it does show that we can produce very productive apples. Um, and um, a colleague of mine saw these and it'll be a Christmas card some year. With that, uh, I gave you a nickel tour, very fast paced of apple breeding and genetics, which hopefully you came away with a little bit better understanding or you can go back to the lab and say, thank God I work on tomatoes. Thank you very much. It behaves like a diploid. But we actually have, we don't have, but they've developed haploid apples, which we're very interested. It would simplify it even more. Yes, yeah, so it's a report by Telius um, uh, at the University of Minnesota. And she looked at Honeycrisp uh, blushed versus striped apples. And um, said that the non-anthocyanin portions were methylated. And I can give you that citation if, if you want. Quality. Quality. Yep. Quality, Quality and I'll, uh, a nod to Chris, but it's true. Being able to store well and having great shelf life. So we've been criticized because we, yes, <laughs> we'll keep you at a job. Um, a lot of the apples that you're familiar with, like Empire or Macintosh, will be at harvest can be 14 to 18 pounds about and can come out of uh, storage very low. We have some apples that are 22 to 25 pounds. It's a whole different animal. We also have some, a lot of people like Honeycrisp, which has good sugar. So if you like an apple, it tends to be 13 degrees bricks. Um, and as the bricks increase, it tends to increase your liking. We have apples that have 16, 18, 20 degrees bricks. Now you can say, oh my God, that would be too sweet. But we also can take the malic acid from like 0.2 or 0.4 to 1.1. And it's like eating shock tarts, which I figure if we could get kids to eat apples instead of those uh, green apple artificially flavored candies, so much the better. So it's, um, we have some apples that have a hint of anise. Uh, you either lo love them or you don't. A lot of people are like, and then other people think that they're wonderful. So we'll have a lot of different, uh, not your typical apples. Um, we're going to try to get some stickers to see if uh, apples color when the sun hits them. And I, I, I was, the article where we did the art, somehow got translated. I showed the Japanese where they put a sticker on and it may mean good health and
the fruit is considered a gift and it, it's um, very carefully reared. Well, uh, a news organization picked it up and talked about tattooed apples. And they had pictures of like the most intricate tattoos, but I figured we could do a big red apple and you know, who knows, it, just by putting the stickers on. But of course, I say that, and then a guy was like, brides and grooms would love to have their, the date of their wedding and their names on an apple. And it's like, oh. <laughs> so don't expect that anytime soon at Cornell Orchards. We have markers, but as I showed you, understanding the phenotypic um, base and the genetics that you're working on, we need to test them across populations to make sure that they're not specific to the germplasm in which they've been developed. So we have markers for malic acid that we've run on our populations, but we're just verifying it. So Kanung Zhu did that. And we also have markers. Uh, we're determining QTLs uh, for different sugar attributes, but we don't have markers for a lot of the traits that are of greatest interest because they're complex, like crunch. That's spread all over. We also have markers for allergens and others. So we have a lot of markers, but again, it's testing them across a wide range of materials that's important. And we're getting there. It's a, it's a great question, and it's, I think it's variety specific. There was a great paper by Gutian who looked at biennial bearing and looked at a lot of the variation, but it will depend on all of those variables, but we do know that some apples are much less variable than others, so there's a strong genetic component, but there's certainly a high environmental component as well. And They don't have qualitative genes for resistance, but they do have very good field level resistance. So for example, Honeycrisp, they've just discovered, has several genes for resistance. New York One being a Honeycrisp hybrid might have such a gene. We used it in crosses to, to, to get a bunch of modifiers, um, but it, we may have incorporated a qualitative gene. And then for things like uh, powdery mildew and fire blight, we have good levels of resistance. So it's not, uh, you know, it's certainly going to need sprays, but they perform better than a lot of the commercial cultivars out there. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.